Hello, everybody. Um, the warmest welcome to you all to the first event um, in our Environmental Humanities and Social Transformation Colloquium. And huge welcome to our speaker, Professor Tiffany King. I'm Anne McClintock, and I co-organize the colloquium with Rob Nixon. I identify as queer, and I answer the pronouns she and hers. I'd also like to begin with a land acknowledgement that here at Princeton, we stand on unceded territory, which is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in their homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Before introducing Professor Tiffany King, some heartfelt thanks First to the High Meadows Environmental Institute, especially former um, director of HMEI, Mike Celia, for his incredibly generous support of the colloquium over the past four years, and indeed for his inspirational support of the burgeoning environmental humanities at Princeton. And warmest thanks to our incoming HMEI director, Gabe Vecchi, for his ongoing support and as ever to Kathy Hackett, without which very little uh, would happen at HMEI. Deep thanks to Raj uh, Shokshi for your brilliant technical expertise and support over the years, to Morgan Kelly and Hans Marciano for your wonderful creative designs. What a great privilege to be part of this amazing team here at Princeton. Um, the colloquium is also co-sponsored by the program in Gender and Sexuality Studies and now by American Studies. And thank you so much to Sarah Malone for your support and helping get the word out. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. So to begin, it's truly an enormous pleasure to welcome our first speaker in our series, Professor Tiffany King. And I'd in fact reached out to Professor King a few years ago, but her visit was interrupted by COVID. But it's perhaps even more fitting in fact, that Tiffany King will be our first speaker at the colloquium today, but also I'm thrilled to announce that she will not only be with us today, but she will be joining us all at Princeton as our spring 2022 Unschutz Distinguished Fellow in American Studies. And next semester, Professor King will teach a seminar entitled Black and Indigenous Feminist Survival and Experimentation in the Americas. Tiffany King is currently Associate Professor of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Virginia. All her work is animated by abolitionist and decolonial traditions within Black Studies and Native Indigenous Studies. She's the author most famously of the acclaimed and groundbreaking book, The Black Shoals, Offshore Formations of Black and Native Studies. And when I first picked up Professor King's Black Shoals a few years ago, I knew at once I had in my hands the most transformative and generative engagement that brings together Black and Indigenous studies, intersectional feminist and queer studies, um, environmental humanities, what she calls erotic ecologies, and all too often these are seen as somehow distinct and separate but she brings them the, together in an electrifying and brilliant transformative engagement. Um, her book won the Laura Romero First Book Prize. She's also co-edited Otherwise Worlds Against Settler Colonialism and Anti-Black Racism, also from Duke. Her forthcoming book, Red and Black, Alchemies of Flesh, Conjuring the Decolonial and Abolitionist Now draws together for the first time links between black queer feminist and native queer feminist traditions. Today's talk, in today's to -do talk, Professor King will think with errant and offshore practices of black intimate encounters with the environment, focusing on black erotic practices that involve dirt, mud, and earth. Professor King will ask, how black erotic ecologies do we imagine human and more than human hierarchies and reorganize sensoriums? And please note everyone, we're going to be um, taking written questions through chat. 
So please send questions through while we're talking and I'll remind you again at the end. So warmest welcome to Professor Tiffany King. Uh, Tiffany, the floor is yours. Hey everyone. I love that people have their cameras on. Hi Darius, it's been a long time. Uh, hi, Rob and Anne. Thank you, Anne, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for being both for being such wonderful hosts and being patient with me this week. I'm, I've been back to Atlanta to pack up stuff and hand in keys and I'll be back in, in the Delaware Valley soon. So thank you for your patience. And thank you to um, definitely um, the High Meadows Environmental Institute and the Environmental Humanities and Social Transformation Colloquium. And thank you for thinking of me. I don't often situate myself in the environmental humanities. I'm definitely not an environmental scientist. I feel like dabble with the eco-criticism. So I appreciate you drawing me into this scholarly community. But what does resonate with me certainly um, um, is, is the rigorous interdisciplinarity that has required me to be a student again. I've just started to grapple with some text from environmental scientists on riverbeds, dry riverbeds, and I'm struggling. I have to literally go back to some basics from high school chemistry and biology and be a better student, right? So it's always requiring some new skill building and some new literacy. So that's what I value about certainly the environmental humanities and also the commitment to really um, grounding your work in movements and communities on the ground. Um, that particular value actually brings me to reflections on my own work. Um, in conversations with my interlocutors, specifically Black feminists, I have been challenged in generous ways. I've been called in to think about some of the aesthetic provocations that I made, particularly in chapter three of my book around presenting these porous and fungible bodies and to think about was I really in conversation with particularly um, Black queer and feminist land-based movements and how useful were those representations and how could my work continue to be more useful? So today I am offering some reflections that ask about the stakes of aesthetics and representations and particularly the stakes of representing Black people on and in relationship with the land. So I want to uh, chew on that and ruminate with you about that. So let me share. Can folks see? Anne, can you give me a thumbs up or a verbal? Uh, yes, thank you. Terrific. OK, great. Wonderful. So I'm going to do a little bit of reading. I'm going to begin this talk by revisiting some of the arguments in the Black Shoals that produced a chafing for some readers. And I use chafe to reference the irritation caused by one's own skin rubbing against itself, as well as to gesture toward the space of a difficult encounter, perhaps another shoal. And I also invoke the self and one's skin to merge the individual and collective to beckon the we of the Black intramural. More specifically, I'm sharing some of the reflections that I've been crafting as I return to honor and think deeply with some of the feedback, specifically moments of discomfort that Black feminist scholars have shared about some of the provocations I presented in the book. These feminist uh, concerns often centered on the representations of Black, porous flesh in chapter three of my book. Let me time myself. So in chapter three, I told a beloved Black feminist film, Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash, who what could be objecting terrain of indigo plantations, theorizations of Black fungibility, and perhaps too far outside the bounds of a kind of recognition that could be useful. These images and scenes that I described in the book focused on Dash's choice to stain her actor's hands blue. This blue color came about because of forced contact with indigo plants, lye, and the toxic solution produced um, during the production of indigo dye. 
I zoomed in on this vision or this image of flesh that has merged with Indican plants and lie as a way of tracing the violence of slavery beyond a narrative of forced labor to mark the makings of a new kind of more than human or porous body. I thought that I had struck enough of a balance between describing in detail the colonial violence that renders, as Vanessa Agar Jones argues, some bodies more burdened by toxins and balance that with scenes of black possibility, loopholes of retreat and humanity on otherwise terms. I also attempted to offer a glimpse, though perhaps too ephemeral and fleeting, of black erotic and queer possibility, as well as the always lurking black insurrection that is also present in the midst of plantation violence, representing the surplus that Catherine McHittrick calls black livingness. I thought that I had been careful, but it seems as if this representation of porous indigo stained black flesh represents a form of black violence, of, of anti-black violence that might not be as easily brought into equilibrium or overcome by a representation of what Neil Roberts theorizes as petite melanage. And while I tried to create a scene of erotic possibility, a speculative landscape of kinship and relations on otherwise terms, I perhaps tarried too long in the blue muck of objection and outside modes of recognition that might be useful to some black feminist political projects. And I think that some of the problems that um, some black feminists have with the representations of blue, black, poor, fungible bodies was that they could not be recognized under a range of available signs like worker, producer, steward, rower, healer, and activist. And I wanna meditate on what these representations of black life made poor, stained blue, and rendered outside of the recognition of worker slash steward mean in the context of turns to the ecological, specifically a burgeoning interest in black ecologies. And now that I'm able to look up for my work and think about the context in which I was writing in which the work was received, I can see how this chafing occurred. As I look back at Black cultural production and Black organizing communities when I was writing the book between 2016 and 2019, um, I realized that I was writing these scenes of fungible indigo stained bodies in a moment when important campaigns for Black farmers were being waged. Um, and the Black food justice and land movements were gaining momentum. This past year, activists from the National Black Food and Justice Alliance and Black farmers experienced some success with the introduction of the Justice for Black Farmers Act in February of 2021. Democratic Senators Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, and Kirsten Gillibrand introduced the act, um, which demands, these are the four, four primary demands, an end to discrimination within the US Department of Agriculture, the protection of remaining Black farmers' lands, land grants to create a new generation of Black farmers and restore the land that Black farmers have lost, and the call for systemic reforms to help family farms at large in the U.S. And some of the provisions that accompanied the act, like the American Rescue Plan that offered $4 million in debt relief to Black farmers and farmers of color, was challenged to some by white farmers and conservative supporters on the grounds of reverse racism, which sounds, it's obscene. And a federal court order has been actually um, ruled and has um, held up the relief. So now I can't get into the weeds of the Justice for Black Farmers Act, but what is important for me to acknowledge and own is that in my argument for a temporary interpretive and theoretical shift away from the black slave as a laborer to fungible flesh inseparable from plants and processes of change, I veered too far away from the black laboring body and specifically the black farmer as a viable political actor with a long history of struggle. I made this theoretical decision during a moment when a concerted effort to get black growers, farmers, herbalists, healing justice workers and economic justice workers back to the land um, was really jumping off. And additionally, this call to return to the land and to return land to black farmers was accompanied by its own forms of aesthetic production. So political campaigns often rely on cultural production that comes maybe in the forms of documentary, books, ads, television shows, movies, novels, in order to humanize the people making claims. And aesthetics function, as we know, to produce norms, a certain kind of common sense. 
and um, give people a sense of what is, is desirable. The Justice for Black Farmers Act needs legible subjects, not fungible ones that white farmers, legislators, and the American public can identify with. And within the visual field, um, things like films, television series, and social media platforms are presenting more images of Black farmers and growers. An example of um, some aesthetic reduction that depicts the farmer as a political actor worthy of inclusion into the settler state is the TV series, Queen Sugar. So the filmmaker and producer Ava DuVernay uh, adapted Natalie Bazile's 2014 actually novel into a television series. And of course this was done with the help of Oprah Winfrey and the OWN Network where it actually um, is actually playing and you can also stream it on Amazon. And the series now in its sixth season presents the black farmer as first and foremost, a steward, a steward of the land and a steward of the political legacy of movements for black liberation through the return of black land. The image of the black farmer finds its primary form in the character Ralph Angel. There are black other Black, primarily men who appear as farmers who are part of a larger Black Farmers Association in St. Joe's, but primarily the focus is on uh, Ralph Angel. And Ralph Angel is pictured here. Um, this is from season five with his um, wife, Darla. Um, Darla and Ralph Angel have a child named Blue and he's in front of a tractor. This reminds me very much of a, a remaking of the American Gothic painting that many of us are familiar with. And in the television series, Ralph Angel is the son of the recently deceased Ernest Bordelone, the patriarch of a Black family who are the descendants of enslaved cane pickers. The Bordelones have returned to the same sugar cane plantation where their ancestors were held captive. And in the first episode, viewers find out that Ralph Angel has been recently released from prison. Over the arc of the show, Ralph Angel seeks redemption and the trust of his family through his work on the land and being a dutiful father, partner. Um, yes, father and partner. And since the Bordelon family came into the possession of the land, the Landry family, whose white ancestors enslaved the Bordelons, have sought to steal the land back. The wealthy stepsister, Charlie Bordelone, emerges to supply the capital to buy the land and start cane production and a processing plant. Ralph Angel is responsible for the daily operations of the farm and through his stewardship restores his masculinity and honor. And what I'm interested in exploring in th these narratives, this one particular of Black um, land stewardship, are the forms of recognition it seems to promise. The author of Queen Sugar, Natalie Bazile, um, authored another book called We Are Each Other's Harvest in April of this year, April 2021. And the book features images and narratives of Black farmers and growers. The images are incredibly captivating and the stories are compelling. And actually on the cover, it's oriented the same way I'm looking at it. You have a uh, Lee Penniman and her sister Na um, Naima Penniman. Uh, Lee is in the shorts and the long boots. And Lee Penniman is the founder of Soul Fire Farms. And Soul Fire Farms, the, per, the vision is incredible. It's something I would definitely call decolonial. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, they have um, taken a cooperative approach to land, so they're using land uh, trust, also an easement that recognizes the presence of the Mohican Nation, which I'll talk to you a bit more, and so are featured on the cover of this book, which for me offers an interesting kind of tension with the way that the book is talked about, particularly by um, Bazil when she talks to Essence. And also I have to acknowledge that Essence is a particular type of magazine um, that might not lean into or acknowledge even the politics of Lee Penniman and Soulfire Farms. So in an interview with Essence Magazine, also in 2021, Bazil was celebrating the images and the narratives of Black farmers and, and shared the following. So in response to the question by the, the interviewer at Essence, how is farming connected to progress for Black people? 
Bazil responds, we have to think about this really in two ways. We have to think about this literally, the literal connection to the land and all the positive effects that come out of being connected to the soil. You have everything from the benefits to your health and well being of being out in the open air, out in nature, what that does for your spirit, what that does for your body. There are all of the health benefits, sense of literal health benefits to knowing where your food comes from. But then there are also the metaphorical questions that being connected to soil represents and farming represents. Those are big questions about intergenerational wealth. When you have something that you own that you can pass on to the people who are coming after you, that's bigger than just putting your hands in the soil. That's about providing assets for your family and for the people in the next generation. And then that goes into the larger question of the wealth disparity between black folks and white folks. And then they ask um, Brazil to say more about the wealth part. And so for Brazil, farming is tethered to this kind of teleological movement toward progress. Progress is health and wealth accumulation. Brazil does not mention um, in this interview or in the book, um, in the intro, um, indigenous people or desire to develop ethical relations with indigenous people in a settler nation. And while Bazil's book does promote a liberal narrative of inclusion that we could argue consolidates and fortifies a settler state, the book does to its, its merit provide a partial directory of black farms and land projects. And many of these projects I was largely unaware of um, while I was writing my book. And, while I've started to take a look at them, I'm not sure that I would embrace all of the missions of all the farmers and projects featured in the book. I do not inherently find black ownership of land on a genocidal, uh, in a genocidal colonial nation inherently liberatory. And I wonder if black land campaigns attached to cultural production like clean sugar and to the extent we are each other's harvest work to promote black farming and stewardship as forms of recognition and attachments that bring us closer to what Danae scholar Melanie Yazzie calls settler ontologies. And by no means is this a wholesale indictment of black farmers or black land movements. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dara Cooper this summer a few weeks ago who um, is a part of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance who was telling me about the back and forth with the drafting of the bill and all of the communities that were a part of the coalition, including indigenous farmers and farmers of color. And also the interesting ways that um, working with legislation and making this issue of redistribution legible, black farmers and black bodies have to often carry the weight and include indigenous farmers and people of color farmers in order to gain wins, right? That's the way that Blackness gets used and marginalized when, when you're talking to the federal government. So that's something that was really um, important for her to um, communicate. It was a great conversation. And also um, the founder of Soul Fire Farms, who we saw on the cover of um, We Are Each Other's Harvest, names herself, Lee names herself as a soil steward devoted to being in solidarity with indigenous communities. Soul Fire actually established the first um, cultural respect easement in the state of New York that actually um, grants all citizens of the Mohican nation, current and future rights to the land forever. Additionally, in Soul Fire's bylaws, they grant um, nature veto power. So it's cooperative framework and, and its ethos and its challenges to the settler colonial state actually end up being diametrically opposed to some of the politics professed by Brazil in this interview. And I really have a desire to see other projects, um, aesthetic projects, particularly move Soul Fire out of proximity to these aesthetic regimes of liberal settler inclusion as are imagined by Oprah Winfrey and Ava DuVernay. And the Black land projects that I am developing relationships to that I visited, um, folks that I know who are doing this work on the ground are founded by Black, queer, and trans people. They center the healing of Black, queer, trans, and non-binary people and continue to challenge notions of ownership, property, and possession. 
Their roots also begin with relationships with indigenous communities. Many of these queer and trans led projects also fall off the grid in interesting ways. The ones that are most compelling to me tend to grow their communities through relationships, not so much social media or high profile um, media appearances. And in some instances, I see them refusing normative modes of recognition. I also think that these projects require their own aesthetic sensibilities and modes of representation. And a part of my project is, seeks to um, look for and examine some of the decolonial aesthetics for Black liberation work that locates their strategies in the land and that do not seek inclusion into settler states. Now, I don't have any elegant way of moving to the part of my presentation that deals with um, some otherwise aesthetics, particularly in literature, that I want to think about as openings. Um, and so I'm going to start reading just what is part two of this presentation. Okay, I've about 20 minutes. I want to register where possible a refusal of or indifference toward stewardship and the recognition it offers. Specifically, when one performs an errant or erotic relationship to the earth, like eating or sucking on dirt. For decolonial scholars like Julieta Singh and Leon Betasama Sophie Simpson, stewardship can function as a form of dominion, even in its attempt at care for the earth. In Julieta Singh's book, Unthinking Mastery, the author or Singh explicates the way that dominion can fold itself into notions of care. For instance, Singh refers to Judeo-Christian notions of dominion that inform the way that humans are taught to interact with the world. In speaking about uh, the Old Testament, Singh writes, in Genesis, dominion becomes a particular human mode of relating to the world, indeed of caring for it through practices of management and expertise that hinge on the human goal of mastering nature in order to let it flourish, to cultivate it, to submit it with the aim of maximum prosperity. In the book, As We Have Always Done, Leanne Simpson reflects on her 2014 interview with Naomi Klein that appeared in Yes Magazine. The interview conducted by environmental activist and author Klein focused on extractivism and the indigenous resurgence movement, I Don't Know More. And while reflecting on this interview, Simpson comes to the realization about both extractivism as a target for political action, as well as its alternative stewardship. Simpson writes, as I drove home from the interview and in the editing process that followed, I could see why Naomi was focusing on extractivism as a narrative that could open up a conversation with Canadians and spark mass movement on climate change without bringing up capitalism and the backlash that it entails. But the more I thought about extractivism as a concept, it did not explain what had happened to my people and to me. Stewardship as an alternative was too simplistic a concept to describe the relationship of the Nishnabeg with land. And I appreciate uh, the way that both of these um, decolonial takes, one from a person who might understand themselves as a settler of color um, on Turtle Island, and um, Leanne Simpson, who is embedded in indigenous resurgence movements, um, probe the limits of the notion of stewardship. I think that's really interesting and important. And in my own assessment of the term in the context of Black land, Black farming, and growing communities, the figure of the steward and the act itself offer a kind of liberal legibility and recognition. And while there's nothing wrong with trying to secure legibility, recognition, and dignity in the face of a violently anti-Black state that's trying to kill you, I'm wondering about the terms of gaining access to humanity, access to humanity through the position of steward. I think that it offers some narrow points of access. The archway is often too narrow for folks who are disabled, poor, working class, and those pursuing errant relationships with non-human life forms. I'll talk a little bit about when we get to the Q&A of my experience of going to um, a community that was on a mountain and just how physically difficult it was to be there and the kind of physical training that I'm actually doing now to prepare myself to be there again. 
um, recently had been approaching and thinking relations to the land through the erotic. And one of those registers of the erotic is Lord's articulation and theorization. And in her oft-quoted uh, passage, Lord names the erotic um, as a measure between the beginning of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. And thinking with uh, Julietta Singh, I want to dehumanize internal sense or the capacity for desire and sensory perception and think about it along the lines as, as this being the earth's capacity as well. And in this sense, um, this mimics a conventional move within new materialism and post-humanist literature by conferring agency to non-human life. However, what I find more interesting is the land's capacity to dehumanize or reorient what Sylvia Winter calls the praxis of being human outside of the mandate to productivity, purposefulness, recognition, and proper subject formation. And for the remainder of this talk, I focus on the Earth's appetite for a humanity that flows outside the orders and protocols of performing man. I track this otherwise flow of humanity through the senses, both human and earthly sensorium. I track an earthly appetite, erotics, and errant sensory perception, which we could also call aesthetics in the work of Black queer theorist and scholar Lamanda H. Stallings and journalist and writer and pundit Charles Blow. More specifically, I focus on Stallings' third book, a Dirty South Manifesto and Charles Blow's memoir, Fire Shove of My Bones. And I was lucky to have been introduced to Blow uh, through his memoir and, and was not aware of um, his career as a pundit and did not see him on CNN or, or MSNBC, which is great because I might not have picked up his memoir if I had. Um, so I consider both texts queer based on their authorship by Black queer Southern writers, the queer content and their erotic renderings of geophagy. And many of you might know that geophagy is a form of pika. Pika is the act of eating non-food items observed in animals or humans. And geophagy is the specific act of earth eating. So the consumption of dirt, clay, soil, and other materials associated with the earth. And this practice has been observed around the world, but more specifically, it gets pathologized um, when it's observed in African descended people or black populations. And in the 18th century, it was often diagnosed as a problem that slaves in the South and the Caribbean had. And when observed in slaves who were refraining from eating food and chose dirt instead, it was considered a problem for the slaves' productivity, right? It prevented them from laboring. So called um, cachexia africana, it also becomes gendered as it was thought to afflict pregnant female slaves, causing an addiction and insatiable desire for dirt or clay. The word addiction here is crucial. Attends to the representations of geophagy in the work of African-American writer Charles Chestnut notes that to addict, um, and this is from uh, OED, in the form of a verb means to voluntarily bind oneself in slavery to another. The context of Chestnut's writing in the 19th century, as well as the narratives of Black enslaved and formerly enslaved people give this valiance of um, addict significant literary import. To addict also means to attach oneself to either a practice or a place. And addiction is an important feature of geophagia to me because it enacts a form of, of Lordian chaos or brings it as close to that Lordian chaos. To engage in earth eating interrupts slaveries and capitalism's mode of production, rearranges normative desire or hunger and disrupts normative notions of human mastery over the earth. Those that succumb to geophagy, usually black, are governed by the force of the earth rather than human systems of order. And in uh, Lamanda Stallings's A Dirty South Manifesto, um, which is really, it, it, the book does so many things, but one of the reasons why I really appreciate it is it's kind of a love letter to organizers, sex workers, reproductive justice workers in the South. And she named some Southernisms or Southern practices, one, 
of which is eating dirt. And here's what Stallings is saying. Eating dirt is an embodied practice that existed before medical boards and cartography and the treatments and treaties constructed out of them. Yet compelled by the land's refusal to be metaphysically alienated from flesh, these dirt eaters pass on knowledge and minerals about an older system so that their descendants may know something more about the world than what dated treaties, proclamations, and certified disorders can tell them. Though economically empowered white communities arduously invent religions or national identities out of opposing dirt, as well as create industry out of possessing it, when Black and Indigenous people or poor queer whites insist with effortless sensorial action upon the value, worth, and natural connection of dirt to living beings, it becomes geophagia, an illness or crisis to be healed or overcome. Nevertheless, what dirt tastes like or the sensation that it evokes, gustatory perception and pleasure is not what settler colonialism has alluded to in its articulation of geophagia as a mental disorder. So this gustatory perception that um, Stallings introduces produces a new kind of desire that subverts this um, Descartes, I think therefore I am kind of onto epistemic statement, the smelling, the tasting, the hungering sense that humans are supposed to suppress is activated by the earth's desire for flesh to be with itself. The desire for oneness, integrity, and wholeness bespeaks of the disruption of a human-made ontological grid in which the human stands separate above and apart from the earth. This queer gustatory perception is also unproductive. It privileges salivating, masticating, tasting, and pleasure over sustenance and health and labor. Geophagia does not move these Southern queers closer toward a cultivation or disciplining of the self or the earth. Charles Blow's depiction of geophagy allows for a different kind of attention and emphasis. Blow's memoir is a coming of age story that takes place largely in Monroe, Louisiana. It is a story of survival, his experience with sexual assault as a child, suicidal ideations, an awareness of his bisexuality and his attempts to resist the seductions and violence of black cis heteronormative masculinity. Charles creates a beautiful portrait of his younger self as a queer child who shared a special intimacy with his mother um, that some derided him for and called him a mama's boy. And Blow's passage depicting uh, geophagy offers an opportunity to read along Black queer and trans lines of gender. Uh, what rendered Blow queer as a child in others' eyes was his non-normative gender performance and its proximity to femininity. Blow offers musings about his queerness as it relates to sexual desire, his loneliness and depression, and his experiences of sexual assault. And I affirm these readings of Blow's queerness, and I offer an additional reading that runs along the axis of a Spillerian recognition as in Hortense Spillers of the Black female within and a masculinity that comes into formation through the feminized act of earth eating. Young Charles and his brothers, in part due to hunger pangs caused by lack of food, dig up and eat clay. So from this passage, this beautiful passage of Blow, Blow writes, when my brothers and I finished our digging in the junkyard, we climbed into the ditch across the street and dug for a treat. We flaked off pieces of edible clay dirt that smelled to me like dry earth at the beginning of a fresh rain and tasted like chalk soaked in vinegar. Folks said it was good for you, settled your stomach, stave off illness. All I knew was the taste was addictive and that ditch where the curve of the road cut deep into the ground and exposed the strata was the only place in town where that dirt could be found. Best of all, it was free. Blow depicts a uh, boy, specifically his brothers, engaging in activity that has been pathologized as a gender performance of deviant Black femininity. They have succumbed not only to the flesh, but to the Black female within and the pull of the flesh on the earth. 
they fail to become autonomous masculine subjects. Admittedly, um, I have to develop this more, but I'm trying to think about this. Clearly it's a scene of, of a homoerotic yearning because Blow yearns to be close to his brothers who largely ignore him and he often feels like an exile in his own home. And the one thing that does draw them close is this um, act of eating and also their shared bloodline. They all have the same mother. And while there are no scenes of the mother eating clay, the specter of the black pregnant mother consuming clay hovers. There's a theory that geophagia is a behavior passed down by the mother to her children. In this instance of geophagy, the deviant earth eating condition of the mother is passed on to the child, not just through the womb, but through the gut. The children follow the condition of the geophagic mother. And while Blow does not assign queer identities or practices to his brothers, scripts of Black mythology that emerge from the tradition of Moynihan, you know, queers boys raised by Black matriarchs. Um, Kevin Mumford demonstrates this well in his article, Untangling Pathology, the Moynihan Report and Homosexual Damage, uh, 1965 to 1975, compellingly arguing that Black matriarchs were perceived as raising queer boys who failed to develop proper Black masculinities. In this instance, Charles and his brothers are not only queered as children raised by a matriarch, but also by the unproductive acts of eating clay. Their clay eating keeps them tethered to the feminine, their mother, and refuses a form of consumption that might provide nutrition, healthfulness, or a productive relationship to the land through labor. They are not stewards, but boys with errant appetites that give into the pull of the earth and the female within. Stallings and Blow, while not providing representations of proper subjects that can be recognized as growers, farmers, healers, or organized labor, do gesture toward a different orientation that moves beyond mastery. And my intention this afternoon is to affirm certain forms of failure and refusal that perhaps provide avenues of escape from normative forms of recognition that lead us to and require mastery, even in their forms of care. So I will say, um, gratefully, there are these Black land projects like Medicine Bowl, um, also uh, Sankofa Maroon Village, founded by Amai Kuda, um, and Medicine Bowl by uh, Kifu Farouk, um, who are grounded in uh, supporting and healing Black, queer, and trans folks, right? And they, they're also committed to supporting the possibility for being more than a steward or a cultivator or owner in relationship to the land. And these projects emerge from years of organizing with indigenous people and do not start out by making claims to black territory or wealth. And they respond to the pull of the earth and therefore their own appetites for healing. And these projects deserve aesthetics that truly meet their decolonial visions. Um, that's all I actually have to share this evening, and I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to talking with you all. Let me stop sharing too. Thank you so much um, for an incredibly generative talk. Again, let me invite people to um, ask questions, send in questions through the chat. Um, Anybody wanting to? Um, Rob, I'm not seeing. You know, um, what I'm going to do is actually um, say if people want to raise hands and speak as well, people might feel more comfortable than writing in. That'd be great. Then I could follow then we can, up. We can, then we can actually we can actually hear voices. So just raise hands and um, and and speak. Go ahead, uh, Rob. Yeah. Thanks so much for a really st stimulating uh, talk. Uh, um, I was wondering if you could just say a few few more words about the relationship between dominion and stewardship. 
uh, that, that seems to be a core conceptual term and, and a very unusual one, but, but seems to have a, a lot of potential for, for rethinking stewardship, perhaps sometimes as an externally imposed obligation that narrows its potential in terms of the relationship to the land. I, I have to be honest and say that I started thinking about the specific connection between dominion uh, as a key word through Julietta Singh's Unthinking Mastery. She invokes um, dominion, right, and wants to trouble that. Um, and the, the reason why I pulled in stewardship is because I briefly saw her mention that, but was aware of the way that Leanne Simpson troubles that um, from tracing her thinking of unpacking stewardship, not just in as we have always done, but also her troubling the notion of the commons, right? A particular European commons that doesn't think about Nishinaabeg relationality. And so um, in my own line of thinking, I'm linking stewardship to labor. I've been spending a long, uh, uh, quite a bit of time thinking with some of the critiques that I've received from uh, my colleagues who are serious Marxist scholars about my critique of labor as being a humanist kind of ontological um, position. And specifically when I think about, or when I've gone back to Marx's 1844 Paris papers of the economic and philosophical manuscript where you, where you do see him acknowledging that there is a kind of interdependency that then Donna Haraway leans into, but I see that kind of reliance or a need to acknowledge the interdependency of the earth by the human as a way of saying we need this um, substratum to exist on. But there, there, then there are all these passages of not even just estranged labor, but ideal labors working upon the earth to know themselves as separate from the objects that they create, mm -hmm. right? So I'm trying to trace this kind of genealogy of thinking about stewardship and labor as a way of separating yourself from the ground, the animal, the stone, right? So I'm linking things like um, Singh's dominion or critique of dominion, um, Leanne Simpson's critique of the steward, my own emerging critiques of labor to think about what it sets us up to do ontologically to position us up above, over, and working on something that needs to be different, right? But this element of the dominion that she's drawing from specifically religious texts, it, you're right, it gets at this kind of in, externally imposed need to perform that to be mm -hmm. a Judeo-Christian subject human, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't say something that's natural to you, but it is imposed. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thank you for that, Rob. Anybody else like to? Hi, can I jump in? Hi, yes. this is Joan. Hi, uh, hi Tiffany. Hi, uh, I'm an anthropologist here at Princeton. I, I, I greatly appreciate um, uh, your talk. It's just it, it's so rich conceptually. And I, and as an ethnographer, I, I paused at that moment when you said something like it was so difficult to get there. It was almost like it wasn't, for me, it was kind of an ethnographic moment. It was an embodied sense of being transported to another place that you yourself as the, you know, as the rich concept maker you are, you, you were transported to that sensorially. Hmm. And, and I was just thinking, how could that apply also to, to some of the characters that appear in the concepts that mm -hmm. you so eloquently juxtapose? Mm -hmm. Because they had different experiences of being transported, different experiences with landscapes, different experiences with different kinds of products that they planted, work with. I was just thinking uh, this, a couple of weeks ago, we read through yours, uh, Silence in the Past, and he was saying how different the experience mm. uh, of the labor of enslaved people were in the US versus in Brazil and the Caribbean, just by the cheer 
work they did in different plantations and mm -hmm. how lethal sugarcane plantations were uh, in comparison, you know. So, so, so I was just, I want to maybe to push you a little bit more how that experience that you yourself had mm. that led you there. How you, do you see equivalences there in the experience of the characters that are so generative to the conceptual mm. work? And can there be maybe some like an excess in that experience that might not be captured yeah. by the conceptual work itself? Yeah, no, thank you for that, John. Um, and I think you're referencing the way I was talking about how difficult it was to be on that mountain when I went to Green Mountain, um, North Carolina to Medicine Bowl a few weeks ago. I, um, yeah, so the story with that is, <laughs> I put myself in this situation several times. Like I was just talking to a group of scholars about, um, being a whole person as an intellectual and really having a, a fitness regime, a moving your body for jo joy regime while you're writing because it, it has caught up to me and I've struggled to be on certain landscapes. So I had to, I was not prepared to necessarily climb steeply for 800, 900 meters. Like I did it, but it was work. And so I was thinking about um, one, accessibility, right? for some black land projects, also a particular kind of preparedness and being ready and what that felt like, what kinds of exertion are required in certain spaces, um, who then can access those spaces. So, but you're as an ethnographer helping me think about difficult access and perhaps not dealing with characters, um, characterizations or even aesthetic depictions of them as fully transparent that there might be an excess is, is so on point. It is actually what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking that the aesthetics of an Ava DuVernay don't capture what happens to a person who's in a sugarcane plantation, right? Like all of the different senses that are at play, all the different kinds of ruptures of linear time that happen. I know that for so many of the folks, and I'll speak specifically about what happens at um, medicine bowls, people do experience themselves as, as going through a portal when they're going up the mountain, right? And so their sense of time and space, their ability to even see clearly is their, one of the senses gets a little bit dampened or hampered a bit for a period of time while you're there. And so other senses kick in. So there are so many other things going on and also, so many of the folks who are returning to the land are very devoted to a particular kind of afro diaspora and spiritual practice. So you need to, for instance, when you're at Medicine Bowl, you're um, taught about the Dagara cosmology, right? And so figure out if you're water Dagara, um, if you're earth Dagara and how to move. So that kind of stuff doesn't often get translated well when you're just talking about a farmer or a steward. And I, there are ways that I see Ava DuVernay trying to do it with some of her characters and then people being like, eh, it kind of fell flat, particularly within this character, Nova, who is an activist, literally like a hashtag BLM activist who also does root work that folks who are in movements are like not feeling it, right? There's, there's an excess that doesn't get fully captured. So I think that the kind of decolonial aesthetics and conceptual work that we build are very layered and complex. I don't always know that they work very well visually. Um, we, there might be ways of accessing a performance, but I'm thinking the kind of decolonial aesthetic is not something that I've seen, certainly not seen on television in, in a feature film or a series. So you're right, there is an excess that is hard to um, identify and make visible, legible, audible. Yeah. Thank you. It's a difficulty in it, which is 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 good in perhaps some ways. Yeah. Or productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Darius. Hey Tiffany. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your work for me is often a reminder to read broadly and return often. Um, and so thank you for the opportunity to engage. And you know. I've learned in the last few years that I come from dirt eating people. 
Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. My mom's side, my dad's side too. Yeah. I got a cousin who, whenever we go to our family land in Arkansas, takes a jar, mm-hmm. grabs some dirt, takes it home, right, mm-hmm. um, for his mother-in-law. And so I'm, I'm really interested in one year engagement with LaMonda's work, like that moment, I'm just over here, like getting my life, scribbling all these maniacal notes. Um, but I'm really curious about where else you envision mm-hmm. taking this um, this mm-hmm. reading, and I and I forget the specific term uh, that you use. Um, yeah, geophagy and geophagia. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm wondering um, where else you might want to take that term. Um, mm-hmm. Are you thinking about embodied practices? Are you thinking about like how we carry it with us, or how folks carry it with them? Um, mm-hmm. Are you thinking about the texture of it when it touches the cheek? Like I'm just I'm so curious about where else you envision this engagement with clay um, leading you in your work. There's so much to do with that. Uh, there's, yeah, you know, I haven't thought that far, but I know that I do. I thought on not the end of mm, the materiality, the taste, the viscerality, because I've never thought of practicing it myself. I will say that after talking to you, I'm thinking about it. I was just having a discussion with people about sucking stones and what that could do, right? Um, That would be an interesting like ethnographic entry point, right? For sure, Um, that could be taken. But I do, I am collecting literature on when it was diagnosed in um, slaves. irrespective of gender, right, Um, about what it says. So I have this one narrative about it um, interfered with their productivity, right, in their labor, but I also wanted to get um, to the subtext of that about cosmology too, right? So in this particular um, piece by Fleissner, who's looking at Charles Chestnut's work, she's thinking about geophagia as a way of enslaved people in the Americas trying to connect back home, right? Trying to um, engage in the same practices that they did when they were in Africa, right? Also creating a new taste for a new place and new community. So those are some other ways of at least engaging that literature, but the practice itself there is, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I have to work with someone because I would indiscriminately be sucking on things and putting stuff in my mouth. So I got to figure that out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have to figure that out. Other questions or comments? I might not see a hand, so just uh, please, just please speak up. And if you're more comfortable, um, here's a a question through the chat. Thank you for sharing your work, Professor King. Can you please speak more about how your interlocutors think with the earth decolonially while employing farming methodologies that attempt to increase and more efficiently process crop yields? So, Oh, I'm sorry, let me find your name. Is it Ipsita? That's Ipsita. Ipsita. No, thank you for that. So my interlocutors right now are affiliated with um, Medicine Bowl and a dodecahedron. I, I do not personally know Leah Penniman who is employing these decolonial farming methodologies, but I would encourage you, and you can email me, to check out a conversation that she had with Winona LaDuke about five months ago, right? Where she she explicitly calls herself a soil steward. So not land, but soil. And I thought that that distinction was important and talks about um, carbon enrichment, also a collective process, um, CSAs, the way that she values the work and tradition of Booker T. Washington and does not throw him away was really important to hear her talk about. Um, But the efficient uh, process of crop yields, I I don't fully understand and I am not in a relationship with her and haven't spoken to her directly about it. But uh, Ipsita, I could email you the link. Um, It was on YouTube where she makes those connections, right? Particularly, 
her investment in developing, I mean, it took quite some time, this cultural easement um, in relationship with the Mohican nation to say that you will always have access to this land, regardless of whether I'm here, right? Your descendants will always have that access. Right. Um, Ashford King, um, I see your hand up. Um, would you, I'm wondering if you would be, if I can invite you to come on, on video, but, and then Nicole, Nicole well Joga as well. Ashford, yes. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Professor King, for this talk. Um, so fascinating, everything you said. Um, and I just actually just stepped out briefly to, to run to the restroom. So I'm so sorry if this is repetitive in any way. Um, but I was also interested in everything you said about Soul Fire Farms um, and kind of the, the deed as a text. Um, the easement, and I, I think I heard you correctly that nature is granted a veto power. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, are there possibilities beyond the poetic of this veto power being granted to nature, beyond the poetic, just on the page of the deed at the level of the text? Um, and also, what is this concept of nature? And if nature truly had a veto power, might agriculture uh, not even be occurring in the first place? Thank you for all those questions. I'm muting and I'm not staying on while people are talking because my internet connection is being weird. Um, so I might have to shut off my camera again, but Ashford, thank you for that. I have questions about that too. I was so fascinated when I heard Leah say that, that we, and it was also, we granted nature veto power. So I would love to see how that's actually written, right? I would love to get the documents because I think, literally how it's languaged um, and how that uttered sentence is constructed and then committed to paper matters, right? And how we even think about nature, right? And construct it. But that is deeply a question for Leah as well. But I also am very interested, Ashford, in how um, other Black land projects, I know that I, I interviewed a Maikuda who is um, a founder of Sankofa Maroon Village about another land project that um, they have been involved in founding with R3 in Ontario, where a similar situation in that um, they have been in conversation with Six Nations to actually give the deed to First Nations people, right? So they were the deed holders. So there are all of these ways of kind of remaking um, title and ownership that are so deeply fascinating that, again, these stories that <laughs> Queen Sugar creates in both the novel form and the television series just don't get at. Like the things that are happening in real time on the land are so complex and often um, crowded out by typical narratives of we need to be speaking to the federal government about sharing the land with you white settlers, right? There's so many things that get um, obliterated and excised in these stories to make them uh, legible to people who are watching and who we want to, to co-sign a bill or you know, become, so, become in some ways uh, sympathetic. So yeah, but that attention to nature in those bylaws and the title in the paperwork for saying, at this point it'll be Sankofa Maroon Village or yeah, are things that definitely, I would love to hear those founders talk about because they are also important practices that can be shared and discussed in, in local contexts and people can figure out if that's working or not, right? And we can learn what's happening, particularly how black and indigenous people are talking to one another. Yeah, so thank you, Ashford. Thank you. Nicole, would you like to pick up from there? Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. And um, my name is Nicole welk -Yeager. I'm one of the postdocs here at HMEI, um, also working with farmers, but particularly cattle farmers and dairy farmers um, uh, in, in the Northeast Coast. And I'm wondering um, where animal liberation uh, discussions are coming into your work. If I'm um, looking at these various different projects with the decolonial and feminist framework, 
if discussions about animal domestication and that history and how that's part of the history of this land is entering into the conversation, if it's in the larger book project and I, I need to like take the time to comb through this book, I, I would really appreciate them expanding on that conversation. Thank you. Yeah, Nicole, you know, it's really not, I feel so out of my depth in that area. So we, we do have to keep in touch. And I do want to let you know that I found out, I think uh, Sharon Holland announced it on her Facebook that she submitted her book. Um, oh, I forget the title, but it is about fundamentally about animal liberation. And she spends a lot of time um, focused on move, right? And we may have heard about move because of um, the way that Princeton and UPenn have actually treated their children's remains, right? And have held their children's remains, but focus is on move and their um, animal liberation uh, politic, right? And as a politic that's oriented towards life, I don't know what she's doing about what's gone on in the contemporary moment about the fight for remains and also some of the recent claims by um, women and, and queer folks, um, specifically cisgender women who are part of MOVE who have made claims to sexual abuse um, and homophobia. I don't know what the scope of her uh, study of MOVE is, but I know that she is explicitly taking on the role of the animal um, within Black life and thinking about animal liberation, at least through move, if not um, throughout greater kind of black or larger black decolonial kinds of struggle. So I would go there. <laughs> I wouldn't rely on me <laughs> at all. Yeah. And I, I wonder if I could jump in there um, briefly. And I'm thinking there's something very suggestive, incredibly suggestive to me in um, the connection between the show as a figure that does so much um, both imaginative and conceptual work, as that offshore formation that is neither water nor land. And it seems that one of the most damaging, some, one of the, some of the most damaging legacies of colonialism was this notion of bounded borders between land and water. Land is that which is has value, has economic transaction, insurance. Water was always something that was slightly more, it, it escaped, it was more errant. But I think one of the things that's so powerful about your work is that figure that refuses that particular colonial legacy. But I'm thinking that the notion that, the, the, that mud is something similar because it's neither really earth nor water. So it, it inhabits that same errant, um, space that is a kind of fluidity. So I'm wondering if you might, well, in all of your work, what I feel you're doing is making these bounded, very damaging historical legacies incredibly fluid and sort of insurrectionary. And I've been working in Louisiana and to think of this, ask this to go back to the question of does nature has a veto power? Thinking of how something like we name these phenomena Hurricane Ida, so for example. But what if the seas are rising up to save the forest? If we can think about the ways in which there's an agency um, in terms of time as well, we know that water can change the shape of land, but Jerry Z has asked, can water also change the shape of time? So I wanna just offer something that I've been thinking through, and this is in Louisiana, but it's really everywhere, which is the oyster mound, which is perhaps op occupies the same sort of in between because oysters are living, they're neither land or they're, no, they're neither water. They compound together like mud does. They're nourishing, people lived off them. But oak trees, um, one acorn would lodge in them and the oak trees would, would grow and flourish and become incredibly productive. There were places where people buried the dead. You were talking about the remains. They buried the dead, but they're also now being used by indigenous communities. And now a lot of other people are thinking about them as natural shorelines. So in other words, I'm guessing ways of living with water as opposed to against it, instead of trying to contain it. So questions of fluidity and time and the relation in your work between 
the shoal and mud seems very suggestive. And oyster mounds, I think, occupies a similar terrain. And I think a great deal of people are challenging the notion, these hard notions of land and water and, begin, and thinking in very fluid, fluid ways. Yes, and I've been thinking with these folks because you know who's working on mud is uh, C. Riley Snorton, who I actually want to bring to Virginia and did, um, I think a presentation um, of theirs is available, of his specifically is available uh, through the Duke Feminist Workshop series. So the year that he was there, I think he did a presentation on mud um, that is so incredibly generative and blew my mind. <laughs> and um, in the ways that you're thinking about agency, it had me think about a couple of lines from this Emmy thesis that I just read that was out of South Africa uh, where a student was, um, interviewing, interviewed like 94 people who practiced geophagy or, or clay eating um, in, yeah, Zulu Natal actually. And so, mm. and, and they were describing, like they weren't trying to have a discussion about the Earth's agency, but they were describing that people would often track where there were termite mounds or ant hills. Right. And then right. Say, oh, that particular dirt and clay is something that actually makes me feel good. And so I'm going to track the termite and the ant, right? So it was a way of attending to the way that earth um, insect life is communicating, right, with you to have a different way of navigating the world, a different way of looking, I think is something. Um, that I also want to think about and, and something that kind of gets me to uh, Joelle's question about what the excess that gets um, hidden or isn't necessarily made available in conventional representations, right? Like how are people smelling differently, tasting differently, looking differently that we can't always kind of register and assess. But yes, yeah, certainly the way insects are shaping the land to give cues to humans about what they might eat, right? Which has been something we've been doing, right? And have stopped, but yeah. Um, am I seeing anybody, uh, anybody else? I don't want to miss anyone's hand, so just please speak up. Yes, um, I'm seeing uh, Malcolm Sen. This was such a generative talk. I was thinking of Kimberly Brown's work in relation to the invisibilized bodies of enslaved black women. I wonder if you might say something more about the importance of the visual in your environmental work. Well, thank you for that, Malcolm. Um... <laughs> As much as I like, I critique the visual, I often end up returning to it. And I can't escape it, right? Um, I think what certainly um, literature theorizations of the haptic um, and other modes where senses converge or combined or you can't distinguish between them are really important to um, the work I'm going to be doing, um, which is going to require a more land-based pedagogy for myself or being on the land, right? And what we could call ethnographic as well, but, but rethinking uh, my senses and my own relationship to them and other people's relationships to their senses are going to be really important. Um, but the visual will remain. I just think it'll be there in a very um, different kind of way. Um, 
Malcolm, I forgot my train of thought. I feel like I wanted to say something. Oh, that was really wonderful. After thank you so that. much. Yeah, no, thank Is you. Is that so helpful? Much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking about Kimberly's work partly because, you know, so much of the, um, the, the visualization of the borders between land and water are through migrant lives today, right? And um, so I was wondering, you know, whether the question of migrancy as a form of being or as a form of inhabitation uh, is somehow kind of playing into your thinking. Uh, but thank you. That was just so wonderful. Thanks. Mm, yeah, thank you, Malcolm. I'm definitely going to return to Kimberly's work, but it, what you just said about migrancy was really um, it was, it became an important part of a conversation I was able to have with Sadia Hartman in UCLA when she was talking about the Sisala that she writes about in Lose Your Mother, this fugitive community um, in the interior um, that is always in flight and always migratory to evade capture, right? And so thinking about um, Black diaspora and people in the Americas as being on the move and not being a kind of tragic rootlessness, but always having to remake and sometimes really generative in new ways your relationship to not just space, but land, water, um, earth, right? Um, insect life, insect nation, um, in really important ways and also acknowledging the ways that indigenous um, Native American First Nations people also are migratory, right? And, and do not want to um, disavow the ways that they're moving and migrating as well, right? And their relationship to land is changing where there might be overlap in also forced migrations that both black and indigenous people have experienced, but also a particular kind of intentional migration um, around um, seasons, right? But thank you for bringing up Kimberly's work as well, which I wanna think with in this, in my newer work. Thank you again. Want to make sure I'm not missing anybody's hands. Just please speak up if you've got questions. Then if there are no more questions at this moment, I'm gonna thank Professor Tiffany King for an incredibly, um, generative and thrilling and exciting talk and please uh, join me in thanking so much and so looking forward to having you here with us uh, throughout next next spring thank you so much and thank I you to everybody well. for joining i look forward to meeting you all in the flesh in uh, the spring thank you for having me that was absolutely wonderful thank you so much and thank you to everybody for joining us Bye.